Okay, turn to Ecclesiastes. everyone. Two more installments from the book of Ecclesiastes. Pastor Rob will be back next week. They've enjoyed their time down in Florida and will be coming home soon. will be back next week to give one more message from Ecclesiastes. But this morning, I'm going to be talking about the, the topic, kind of a heavy topic in Ecclesiastes, which is the, the topic of our mortality, our, our death. And uh, while it is a heavy topic, we are going to see that there's actually tremendous encouragement here and hope here um, because of the gospel. And so as we get started, I want, to, I want to share something with you. Years ago, I read a book called Love's Executioner. It's written by a, a professor of psychiatry at Stanford. And this book is his, basically his theory of counseling and also, along with that, it's, it's a number of stories, really raw stories and details of some of his counselees as he worked through things with them. It's people who struggled with all sorts of heavy, difficult, enslaving things in their lives, anything from, from uh, morbid obesity to sexual addiction to terminal illness to broken relationships, divorce, things like that. So it's, uh, it's a really thought-provoking book, and uh, in some ways it's a really troubling book, but it was, it was helpful to read, to, to think deeply with, with him, someone who's experienced in counseling many, many people who had given it a lot of thought, and he's not a Christian author, but he says something really profound, really profound about death, because every one of his counselees, whatever their issue was, whatever they were struggling with, every one of them on some level was grappling with the reality of their mortality, their fragility, and their inevitable death. And this is something he said, having contemplated the topic with so many people throughout his practice, this is something he said that I found fascinating. He said, though the fact, the physicality of death destroys us, the idea of death may save us. Though the fact, the physicality of death certainly destroys us, the idea of death may save us. Fascinating thought. Well, this morning in Ecclesiastes, we're going to spend some time contemplating the idea of death with King Solomon who was, aside from Jesus Christ, who was the wisest man to ever live in this world. And we're going to see that he also believed that contemplating death was helpful, even though it leaves us with so many questions. So turn to Ecclesiastes 7, the first passage, like last week. We're going to jump around a bit, okay? And as you're, as you're turning over to chapter 7, I'll say, since we arrived a few months ago, there have been a, a number of, of deaths in the church, a number of losses. And, and last week, I officiated a memorial service for a dear family. And so I know this topic, um, depending on where you're at in life, what season of life you're in, what's happening in your family, this, the particulars, th this may be more difficult for you or... or Less difficult, I don't know, I don't know where you're at. But either way, whatever your current experience is, I believe there is tremendous encouragement that we're going to receive this morning. And I, I just hope and pray that God gives you that encouragement. Even as we begin kind of the first half of the message, just contemplating the fragility of life, mortality. So here in chapter 7, look what, look what Solomon says, which is also fascinating. Because it doesn't seem intuitive, but look what he says in chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. It says, a good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. It's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Which is like saying, just pause for a moment, it's like saying it's better to go to a funeral than to a party. Which is really strange, isn't it? Okay, continue reading with me here. He says, because that is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart 
Sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. So you see Solomon saying, hey, there's wisdom to be gained in thinking carefully about our mortality, about death. There's something beneficial about it. What, what could that be? Well, let's make some more observations. As I said, we're going to move around in the book of Ecclesiastes. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, as he contemplates death, he sees something about the... Um, well, why don't we just turn to Ecclesiastes 3. Verses 18 through 21. And he just talks about the, the vanity. Remember, throughout the book, the main theme is vanity, 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 emptiness, vaporous, things just I can't quite get my hands on them. Well, here he talks about the vanity of, of people dying just like animals die. Look at verses 18 through 21. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward, and the breath of the beast ascends downward to the earth? Solomon knows he knows his Bible, so to speak. He, he knows the writings of Moses. He knows that man was created from dust. And he knows that man was crowned with great honor and glory. And that man was given dominion over the earth, including all, all the animals. But he says, hey, when you think about mortality, when you think about the fact that one day we too will become dust, he says there's a sense in which we're really no better than the beasts. You are Created in the image of God, you are better than your dog or your cat, but you're kind of not. And because just as they will die, you too will die. You too will return to the dust. Notice next, um, turn to chapter 7 again. In chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Here he talks about the vanity of people dying both in righteousness and in wickedness. And this is particularly vexing. Look at verses 14 and 15 of chapter 7. In the day of prosperity be happy, but in the day of adversity consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. I have seen everything during my lifetime of futility. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. There's a righteous man who dies in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Now turn over to chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. He says, it is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, and for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As a swear is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of envy, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. I mean, he just says, look, they... Everybody is going to the same ultimate end, the same place, death. And he says, whether you're righteous or you're wicked, whether he gives all these examples, whether you're clean or unclean, uh, one who sacrifices or one who doesn't, one who's religious, one who's irreligious, it's indiscriminate. Everybody dies. Everybody goes. And in one sense, he's saying here, this, this is almost not fair. Maybe the, the best person you ever knew died young. The worst person you ever knew, still living, long life. How is that fair? But the world we live in, he says, is like that. And, and Solomon is struggling through and thinking through this. Death, the great equalizer. In chapter 7, back to chapter 7, and verse 17. I know we're jumping all around, so we'll keep you on your toes again this morning. Chapter 7, verse 17, he says, Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Here it seems to almost contradict. He says, well, it's 
The righteous die, the wicked die. But here he's saying, well, there's a sense in which the, the wicked hasten their death. He, and he says, don't do that. You don't have to hurry up your death by reckless living or foolish living. Of course, there are all sorts of factors in the, the length of our lives, naturally speaking. And he's saying, well, the abusing Things like alcohol or drugs or even food or other things that other practices and habits in life that could, that could lead to just biological reality of just affecting our health or, God forbid, the worst, causing us to, to see an early death. He says, like, there's a sense in which living recklessly or foolishly can kind of hasten death. And yet, I believe Solomon understood that God was sovereign over that as well. And God determines the end from the beginning. And He's numbered all of our days, as it says elsewhere in Scripture. So these are the types of observations he's making. And we won't look at any more, but there are many that we could consider. But it's like these types of observations. And if we want to kind of encapsulate it, he's just thinking of this idea that we were created by God, originally from the dust. Of course, we are born via procreation, but Adam from the dust, and then to the dust we return. Maybe you've heard that expression sometimes spoken at Roman Catholic funerals, but from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Maybe you've heard that expression, but it's this idea that we came from dust and we, we end in dust. I mean, just for a moment... I mean, look, look, at your, look at your hands, okay? Your hands, your arms, your flesh. That's, I mean, think about the fact that you, you have a limited number of, of uses of your hands. And at some point, this flesh and bone, it just will decay and be dust. At some point, that's going to happen, every one of us. And there's something about that that's humbling, isn't there? Something about that kind of puts us in, in our place, that we are very small, finite, limited fragile creatures. It's true. It's a fact. This is interesting. Solomon didn't have access. He didn't have Google back then. <laughs> but we have Google and we have access to all this information. In the United States, there are approximately 320 to 330 million people. 2.6 million people die every year. That's about 7,123 people every day. 297 people die every hour in our country. This, is, again, is on average, okay? And five people die every minute. Just in our country. That's not even the whole world, just our country. That's a lot of death, isn't it? And we often, in, in the pace of our lives, in the, in the uh, different activities we're engaged in, we, we don't think about that. But that's, that's reality happening all the time. And Solomon is inviting us to pause and contemplate our death. That every day we live, we are one day further from the day we were born and one day closer to the day we die every single day. It's like we're on this conveyor belt. There's no stopping it. This is interesting. Um, I found, I was just curious to look this up. Do you know the life expectancy is much higher now than it was previously? In our country in the 1800s, the life expectancy, and this is again is on average, and men for men it was a little younger than for women, but on average in the 1800s, the life expectancy, you ready for this? 40 years old. 40 years old. I mean, you see, I'm 46. It seems so young, right? By the early 1900s, it went up closer to 50. Throughout the 1900s, it continued to grow. That life expectancy went up and up and up. And now, it's fluctuated in the last few years. Of course, COVID affected it. But now it's in the sort of mid-70s, just on average, that a person could expect to live. For one thing, it's interesting just to consider that's, that's a lot longer. I mean, you talk about the 40s back in the 1800s, now mid-70s. And here's what's interesting about that. We can say, well, we've, we've come a long way in terms of Technological advancements, medical advancements. We, we can do more now than ever to 
to preserve and prolong life, can't we? And that's a great thing. We're all thankful for that, and that's good. But here's what's just mind-blowing, okay? And again, from the perspective of someone like Dr. Yalom here who wrote this book, or someone who's involved in ministry or counseling, and, and I think you can, you can identify with why this is interesting. Like, never have we been, never has the life expectancy been older, never have, have we lived longer, and yet never have we been more plagued by anxiety and depression than we are today. And it's just an interesting correlation there. In some ways, we have it so good by comparison, relatively speaking, and yet we're still plagued by anxiety, fear, depression. And of course, that's on the rise, sadly, in our culture. It's on one hand, there's, um, and you may have noticed this, I've observed this, there's a lot of preaching of safety out there just in the world, just on TV and on the internet and talking with other people. If you, if you listen to commercials these days, have you noticed a lot of commercials are, are saying things like, hey, our company is committed to keeping you safe. Have you noticed that? The word safety, have, have you noticed people saying, and I've myself said this, uh, we used to say, have a good day. Now we say, stay, stay safe, which is another way of saying, don't die out there. <laughs> don't die. Stay safe. On one hand, that's entirely appropriate, and we want to stay safe, and as Solomon just said, hey, don't be, an, don't be an idiot, don't be a fool, like don't live, re- like be wise, stay safe. On the other hand, we are so obsessed with staying safe that we're sick, like mentally ill in our endeavor to stay safe. We may be in one sense safe, but in another sense we are enslaved, not free. Jesus said it this way, whoever wishes to save his life, and it's literally to save his soul, whoever wishes to save his soul will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you notice the contrast there? See, what it is, is we humans, from the very beginning, from the garden, we've taken upon ourselves the burden of sovereignty. I'm the sovereign of my life. I'm the author of my life. I have to control everything, even my mortality. I've got to manage it, and we're killing ourselves. So I think Solomon would say, hey, listen, think about it. Think about the things that eat you up so much that just drive you crazy, the people that drive you crazy, the stresses of your life, the frustrations, the fears, the things that keep you up at night. What are those things? Somehow, some way, it connects to your preservation of yourself and your life and what's dear to you. And there's a sense in which God is inviting you through the gospel, ready for this, to just let go. To let go. Now Solomon, we're going to keep thinking a little bit. We're going to talk about this hope. We're going to get more and more into that as we move along in the message. But just a little bit more of thinking. Now, now think, Solomon takes this turn. This is, this is fascinating how he does this. I mean, I believe he's struggling. He keeps saying, this is all vanity. It's empty. Something's missing here. But, but then he starts to say, but you know, hey, in light of this, since it's this way, hey, make the most of your life. I mean, kind of like says, like, celebrate your life. And so let me just show you that in a few places. Chapter 3, verse 22. He's talked about mortality. It's a passage we looked at earlier. It's the fate of of man, just like the fate of animals. It all goes to the same place. And after he says all that morbid stuff, he says in verse 22, "Uh, I've seen that there's nothing better than a man should be happy in his activities, for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Hey, look, knowing you're going to die, hey, just make the most of your time. Just make the most of your activities. It's like the, the message on work last week. Just do your, do your work and enjoy your work and do the best you can. He says that. Back to chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. There's where he talked about there's one fate for all. And here he says, hey, go then. In light of that, eat your bread in happiness. Drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given you 
under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Make the most of it. Enjoy your spouse. Enjoy your family. So he, he, he takes this turn and says, look, it, life is um, sad and it's brief and it's fleeting, uh, but make the most of it and enjoy your activities and invest in people. And, and I, in a way, he's saying love people and, and have a good time in life. But it's like, how, how do those follow? It seems like a, I just had this big word in my head, it's like a non sequitur, like logical, philosophical language, like it doesn't, one doesn't follow from the other. How, how do you get there? And it's, I think, in part he gets there because he knows, look back, oh, actually ahead to chapter 12, he, he, he knows there's a creator and that, and that helps, that grounds him, I think that helps him turn the corner. But we can go even farther down this hopeful path than Solomon at his time could because we know more and we're going to get there in a second but look what he says chapter 12 remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say I have no delight in them he says remember your creator remember that you have a maker who gave you life and then he goes through and, and uses this vivid imagery just to describe the 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 demise of, of man before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few and those who look through the windows grow dim and then go down, just jump down to verse 7 there. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And he ends on this note in verses 13 and 14. The conclusion then, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep His commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So this kind of final conclusion. Okay, do you have a creator? You're mortal. He's immortal. Fear Him. Keep His commandments. Guard them. Treasure them. And he says, and in the end, God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden Good or evil. There's, there's a final analysis, and God is over that. That's what he says. That's how he concludes. And i got to be honest, as I read and think through this, I, it leaves me hanging a little bit. It's like, it's, how, how, do you, how do you go from how horrible all of this is, and how fragile we are, and death is inevitable, and death affects the righteous and the unrighteous, and the clean and the unclean, and just like the animals, you're going to die, and on the way to church this morning, we saw at least, I don't know, three or four different dead animals, roadkill, every, just death, reminders of death everywhere. He's like talking about these morbid, unpleasant things. And then he says, well, and make the most of your life and enjoy your activities and enjoy people. How, it's, how do you, I still, something in me just struggles, but I think in progressive revelation, God is helping us see more and more clearly. He, he allows us to think with Solomon, but there's, there's more. So turn to John. The, the reason that uh, we are even preaching through Ecclesiastes right now, spending some time here, is because Pastor Rob and I, as we talked about, we say hey, Ecclesiastes really set, it's like this softball lob that just sets you up for the gospel to knock it out of the park in the gospel of John. And so many of the questions that are raised in Ecclesiastes are answered in, in John, including this question, this issue, this difficult matter of mortality. In John, we see as God, the Son, the Creator of all things, Jesus enters into His world which He created, into His fallen world, into His decaying world. The, the Creator enters that very world and He enters as a God who is sovereign over resurrection, who promises resurrection, who gives us hope. So John chapter 11 this is one of my favorite resurrection stories. Of course, precedes Christ's own resurrection, but this is him loving a family. Walking through, as I said, I, I walked with a family through death recently. Uh, many in the church have experienced this in recent days. And here is Jesus, God in the flesh, walking through this with a family Beginning in verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. 
It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So we've, we've contemplated death, and here we have Jesus loving people who are struggling with death. This is God, explicitly it says in verse 5, He loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and we could fill in the blank here with your name, your family. God loves you. God cares about you. God understands your difficulty with your mortality. Jump down to verses 17 through 27. So when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God. He who comes into the world. I mean, these are the words we need to hear, right? These are the words we desperately need. When we think of our own mortality, the mortality of everyone we care about. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even when he dies. Now we're getting to something solid. We're getting to real hope here. As Solomon could only grope for, he was wondering about, he knew of his creator. And now Jesus comes and we see in vivid color, crystal clear, God's resurrection, life, immortality. Come to meet us right where we're at, right here, right in our weakness, right in our smallness. And our fragility meets us right here. And in one sense, he says, hey, accept it. I, I, years ago, shared a message in the middle of COVID. A message at our church just talked about accepting death and living life. Accept it. it. Puts us in our place. And that's not a good, I mean, you hear the expression, you know, so-and-so puts you in your place. I mean, that's not a positive connotation to that. But this in it is, is very positive. To be put in our place to remember that we are just creatures. And we're in the hands, not of our own sovereignty, not of our own ability to manage our mortality, but we're in the hands of our Creator, the, the actual one who's really so sovereign. Like the only one who's really sovereign. And basically what he's saying here in, in this familiar story with this family is, hey, I'm here to rescue you. And that's exactly what he goes on to do. He, he speaks to Lazarus in the tomb. He says, Lazarus, come forth. And he gets up and he walks out. He just says it. Just the Creator just says and does. It just happens. It's an amazing ability that we know nothing of humanly. He gives life. And then Lazarus went on. To, he's not still alive today, is he? He went on to die at some point. So his hope, too, was in the final resurrection, just like ours. But we have that hope. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children, that is us, the children of God, you, me, everyone, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. 
He comes to those locked in a prison of fear. Fear of mortality. Inability to accept mortality. Refusal to accept it. Every that part of us, there's a, there's a healthy part of us, the will to survive, and then there's that unhealthy, toxic, enslaving part. And he comes to that enslaving, sinful, rebellious part of us, that self-sovereign, that autonomous, everything revolves around me, that part of us. He comes there and he says, I meet you in that place of death. I unlock with my key, your prison cell, and I let you free. I let you go. You're free. The good news of who your God is, what He's done for you, the fact that through Christ He loves you, has forgiven you all your sins. Remember, in Solomon's day, he's thinking like he's righteous and unrighteous and clean and unclean. In Christ, you're all clean. You're all righteous. You're all covered. You belong to your Creator. So that even when, even when this body quits, breathes its last breath, held by my sovereign, loving creator, and brought to new life. To be absent from the body is to be present with him. There's a, I'll close with this. There's a, there's a movie I watched years ago starring Robert Redford. It's called All is Lost. Maybe you've seen it. It's called All is Lost, and in the movie, Robert Redford portrays an um, experienced sailor who just goes out by himself on his sailboat for what seemed like it was going to be just an enjoyable sail for him out there. And at one point, he's on his boat, and, he, and he's falling asleep, taking a nap. He's relaxing out there in the open water, and he wakes up to the sound of an impact, and then right away, the, the boat's filling with water. There was a a storage container had fallen off of a big ship and was floating there and just collided with his sailboat and punctured a hole in it. Well, he gets up, and he's an experienced mariner, so he gets up, and, and he knows what to do, and he starts working right away to, to clear the water out and then to patch up that hole. And so he gets through that, and he's been knocked off course a little bit, and his navigation system doesn't seem to be working. He's trying to figure out where he's at, so he's, he's trying to get his bearings, and and then he notices off in the distance that this storm is coming toward him. So this storm eventually moves in. And his, his little sailboat's getting thrown all over the place. And at one point he gets thrown off the boat. And then he has to actually swim back. And somehow he gets his way back onto the boat. And he's just watching. It goes on and on for him just, just struggling to make it through this terrible situation. And things go from bad to worse. It just keeps getting worse and worse to where finally the boat... Uh, Breaks again in that, in that storm. It's taken on more water. It starts to capsize. He has to inflate this, this life raft, and he gets on this kind of circle life raft thing, and now he's watching his boat sink, and he's got limited supplies, and this is going on now for like a few days, okay? This is going on and on. He's struggling. You, in one sense, you're super impressed because this guy is amazing in his ability to keep things going. He's, he's capable, and he's not losing hope, and he's just fighting, and he's like kind of, his, his will to survive is kicked in, and he's just doing it. But things... Still don't work out for him. I mean, at one point, he's on the, I remember this scene vividly, he's on his little life raft, and he's trying to fish because he's starving. He's run out of food. So he's fishing, and uh, he's reeling a fish in. As just as it's about to get to his raft, a shark comes and eats it, which is like bad day, okay? <laughs> like, one, it just ate your fish. Two, now you know there's a shark right near you. And not only is there one, but it gives you some footage from underneath. You see there's just sharks swimming around his life raft. If that's me at that point, I don't know, I just like, just jump out of the boat, just take me, I'm done. Like, I just looked at my brother Brad out there, says, Pierces, we're, this is, we're not very strong in these situations. We, I would have tapped out probably day one in that situation. But uh, he just keeps going and going, and, 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 and there's a, he sees a big ship off in the distance going, he's like, oh, this is, so he lights a flare, and the ship just goes, Time goes by, now it's nighttime, it's dark, he's out there on that little raft floating and sees another ship. And he's, he doesn't have a flare anymore, he, and somehow he starts this little fire, and he literally sets his lifeboat on fire. This is his last ditch effort. He's like, oh, I got, I got to get their attention. So he, light, he lights that raft on fire, hoping they will see it. And they just continue. The life raft 
um, deflates and he just drops into the water and you watch him, he's just floating on the surface and eventually he just lets himself sink and he just, just shows his body just sinking down into that deep ocean darkness, blackness and he's done. Until this little ray of light shines through the surface of the water. I'm not crying for Robert Redford, by the way. <laughs> um, but because of the analogy, which I think you're following, this light shines through the water, and he, it like quickens him for a moment, so he snaps out of it, and he swims up, and this, this arm reaches down and just pulls him out of the water. Listen, uh, even when all is lost for you, it isn't. We all lose everything in the end. And we don't. We gain everything. Because it's eternal life. Because there's a God who loves you, who created you, who is sovereign over you, who cares for you, and who promises you, says, if you believe in me, you'll live even when you die. Amen. And that is good news, isn't it? That's good news. That's awesome. And maybe if we can hear these words of hope, encouragement, and be reminded of who our great God is, maybe we can experience some more freedom from that enslaving need to preserve our lives. Maybe like Solomon, we'll be able to live our lives a bit more with some lightness and some enjoyment, maybe even some humor, as we await our final day, knowing that even when that day comes, even when we perish, we have everlasting life. Because of our great God. I'm going to stop crying and pray here. I'm going to try. Let's pray and uh, give thanks to our great God. Father, thank you so much for the hope we have. Because of who you are, who your son Jesus is for us. The resurrection and the life. There's so many reminders of our inevitable death. And, and God, we don't like them. You know that. We don't like illness, pain in our bodies. We don't like watching our loved ones suffer or worse, die. It grieves us. It makes us feel empty. Sometimes it makes us feel angry, angry at you even. And in all this darkness, which we would be stuck in, You shine your light. You speak truth. You tell us you're our creator. You're our maker. That everything we have is from you. And though we've all rebelled against you, though we've all gone our own way, though we've, we've, though we've all invited immeasurable hardship into our own lives through our own sin and our own hate, though we've, we've all done that, though that's true, uh, you love us. And you forgive us and you shower us with mercy and grace. And you assure us that even when it seems like all is lost, even when we can't seem to do anything else to hold on to life, even when we perish, we're in your hands. And you will raise us to live with you forever, to finally be freed from all the sin and all the shame and all the brokenness and all the pain, to have every tear wiped away, go on to an eternity with you. It's just amazing to us, God. This is this grace that we don't deserve and we're so thankful for. So thank you so much for the good news. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for speaking life into our death. Help us to believe Help us to trust you and walk forward in our lives 
with some freedom. And lastly, God, I just pray for, for someone here, maybe many people here, who are just plagued by anxiety, fear, maybe anger, because of some sense of loss or some fear of something that could be lost. In that wrestling, God, would you meet, would you meet that person who needs you, who needs your kindness, who needs your mercy? Would you meet them and would you help set them free with the good news of Jesus? In his name we pray, amen.